Good morning. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to take a moment and to read aloud today's text, which is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Today we're going to be looking at verses 41 through 44. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to pause the video and read that text out loud. Welcome back. Ever since my children were young, very young, I've been talking to them about what it means to truly know others and to be known by others as well. It's one of the most important aspects of the human condition. It's one of the most significant challenges we face in uh, human life, and that is to know and be known by others. It's way up there, right up there with learning how to give and receive love. Today, the passage that we're going to look at is uh, the continuation of Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. See, if we remember from last week, uh, we talked about biblical peace as being defined by or constituting the reality of resting and rejoicing in the rule of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the challenges for us as believers is to learn how to rest and rejoice in the rule of Christ, to trust that God sits upon the throne room of heaven, knowing his people, knowing uh, the providence that he has decreed for the events of human existence. We know that God brings peace to us through Christ, and that that peace extends uh, first inwardly, that we would sort of in our inner being have peace. Secondly, that that peace would extend outward to our neighbors and our communities, our cities, and all the way around the world. That we would be at peace with one another. And of course, most importantly, that we would be at peace with God, which can only happen through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we continue those themes today, we're going to see a bit of a contrast. In fact, it's a dramatic contrast between the celebration, uh, the singing of ancient songs by the people of God as Jesus approaches the city of David, in celebration of the king coming to take the throne that will have no end. Jesus is being received by the Jewish people in his procession, in this giant and elaborate and joyful par parade. Uh, the children are singing songs about Jesus' kingship. And yet... There's a huge disconnect between what the people are expecting and experiencing and what Jesus knows is coming and what he himself is personally experiencing. Take a look with me. Here we are in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 41. When Jesus drew near, that is Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Jesus here is weeping. Why is he weeping? He's weeping because many around him think they know him, think they know his mission, think they know his purpose, think they know what's coming. And yet many, oh so many, haven't a clue about what he's doing, about what his priorities are, about what he truly values in the worship of the Father. 
See, last week we looked at resting and rejoicing in the rule of Christ. Today, we're going to be focused on what it means to truly know others and be known by them. We called last week the triumphal entry. I think there's good reason for us to do that as an anchor point to the onset of Passion Week, what church history is often referred to as Passion Week. That is the week of Jesus' suffering. It comes from the Latin term pati, which means suffer. And so it's Passion Week. And as we begin the Passion Week, Jesus is emotionally experiencing something that is dramatically different from what all those others around him are experiencing. In fact, one commentator went so far as to say, maybe we should no longer call this the triumphal entry. Maybe we should call it the tearful entry. As we will see, Jesus is weeping. But why? What is the source of his sorrow? What is the overwhelming compassion that is spilling out through his eyes as he's experiencing this moment? See, we remember that the crowds were cheering and singing, that they were enjoying this parade. We remember this moment as Jesus is riding the borrowed beast of burden a young donkey, and the crowds are rejoicing. They're singing these ancient songs about Jesus as their true king. And of course, what they were singing is true. It's entirely accurate. And yet somehow, there's something missing here. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of kings. And he's right to receive their worship. In fact, we concluded last week with the reminder that Jesus gave the Pharisees and the, the leaders in that community that wanted it to stop, that wanted the parade to end, that wanted Jesus to rebuke his disciples for worshiping him and celebrating him. And his response to them was, hey, if these people don't worship me, the very rocks around us will cry out in song. I am to be worshipped and glorified. It is proper that Jesus is worshipped. It is proper that Jesus is given all the glory and honor we could possibly muster. And yet, there's also a disconnect because Jesus is overcome with the burden of lost souls. He's overcome with the emotion of others. This is not some kind of self-pity party that Jesus is having. He's not just looking ahead to the crucifixion, regretting that it's coming. In fact, far be that from true. It's the opposite. It's that he's not truly known by all of those around him. There's a very few that see him as the long-promised suffering servant. He's told the disciples on a number of occasions that he is coming to Jerusalem to die. And they still don't understand. They don't understand their need for this moment. They don't understand the, the mechanics of this exchange. That Jesus is the Lamb of God has been pronounced by John the Baptist all the way back at the beginning of his professional ministry. As soon as Jesus was engaged in public ministry, John points him out and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's no secret that Jesus is the long-promised Messiah. What's misunderstood is how he will grab hold of his kingdom, how he will establish the ground that forgives people of sin. 
There's no power in the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, the author of Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. Only the blood of Christ can cover sin. Only the blood of Christ is payment for the penalty of all of our sin and unbelief. So, have we asked ourselves in this moment, not what is the crowd feeling, but what is Jesus feeling? And Jesus is feeling compassion. Compassion that leaks out his eyeballs. This is not mere sentiment or some kind of experiencing uh, sensationalism. Jesus is burdened by the lost souls in this city. He's burdened not by the weight of the cross, but the weight of of all that leads him to the cross. Jesus is overcome with emotion for others. He's overwhelmed with compassion for all of the lost city sinners in this city. See, Jesus is bringing peace, eternal peace and salvation to the very ones who in a matter of days will be crying out at the top of their lungs for his crucifixion. See, Jesus knows what so few know, who he is and what he has come to do. He has come to be and bring redemption. And it is through the blood of Jesus that we know God. So Jesus has come to make his Father known through the righteous life and atoning death that he offers. And so most of Jerusalem simply didn't recognize him as the true Messiah that he was, that he still is the long-promised suffering servant whose blood was needed to cover their sin and pay for their guilt and create peace with God. We know that some of the, the inhabitants of this city wanted political salvation. They thought that what it meant that Jesus was coming as king would mean that he would overthrow Roman rule. We'll see at the end of our text today that the opposite is, in fact, most noticeably true here. There are others who are asking for some type of political salvation or uh, ethnic salvation. They want to go back to the, the good old days. Isn't that always the draw of religion, that there's some former period of time that, that if we would just trust our leaders, we'd go back to? As if the greatest isn't ahead? Doesn't God save the best for last, as imaged in the wedding of Cana in Galilee? Of course it is. But even after his resurrection, before his ascension, Jesus' closest disciples are still trying to figure out this whole kingdom business. He just taught on the parable of the ten minas. He's uh, brought close to Jerusalem. And, and in Acts 1.6, we read this. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Even after his death and resurrection, even after all of the instruction that the disciples had been given, they're still dumbfoundedly asking, well, uh, is it now? Uh, is it now? You're the, you're the son of David, and you're going to sit on the throne of David forever. Can, can we begin that process now? See, they, they just don't get it. And you know what, friends? We, way too often, just don't get it. We don't understand what it means that there's this long delay between the inauguration of his kingdom at Pentecost 
and the consummation of his kingdom when he returns. We keep thinking that the kingdom of God will look like the kingdoms of man when it's so much better. So, Let's, let's wade into this. So Jesus is drawing near the city. He's, he's weeping over it. In verse 42, Luke gives us this deep insight as to why. Jesus cries out and speaks out loud and says, Would that you, and of course he's speaking to the city here, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. This is reminiscent to me in the conversation Jesus has with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. We we love to look at the first half of that conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus, but we often forget the rebuke that is buried in there, where Jesus says, Are you not the teacher of Israel, and you don't understand these things? Shouldn't you understand these things? He's not speaking deep and profound, unimaginable things. He's speaking things that Nicodemus, as a leader in Israel, should have understood. Jesus is coming to the city that should know more of the promises than anywhere else on planet Earth. And yet they, even they, have no idea who he really is what he's really coming to do, how he will accomplish that which he's coming to do. They don't understand the the mechanics of their own salvation. They don't understand the time frame of that salvation, and they don't truly grasp the weight and weightiness of this moment. In fact, Look at the way that Jesus phrases this. Would that you had known on this day what? What did they not know? The things that make for peace. They don't understand where peace comes from. Their peace is not found in political uh, ascent. Uh, ascending to some throne somewhere. It's not uh, found in their ability to have self-determination. Their peace is not found in man's rule over man. It's not found in power. It's not found in fame or wealth. What is it? What are the things that make for peace? It's the release of entitlement, isn't it? What makes you most peaceful is not the loud clamoring for more. Aren't you tired of the loud, exhausting clamoring for more? More things, more stuff, more power, more, more, more. More of everything and anything but God. This is not fitting for the people of God. We are to be loudly clamoring for more of Him. Peace is found in Him. Not in human power, not in human authority. Real, eternal, lasting peace is only found in Jesus Christ. And it is found in his life, it's found in his death, it's found in the resurrection and ascension. The messianic reign of Jesus is the foundation of our peace. That's what Jerusalem means. Remember last week? Jerusalem means foundation of peace. They don't even know what their name means. The city that he comes to. But Jesus is lamenting. This is a loud cry of lament. 
Jesus is not filled with a, a bitter sorrow unto death. This is a sorrow unto life, eternal life. He's not filled with self-pity, as I said earlier. It's, it's been hidden from their eyes, the significance and power of this moment. And yet, they don't know him, not truly, not fully. Most of them have no idea why they're singing or what they're really singing about. See, they're all taking tiny little refrains and sound bites and molding them into their own expectations. But that's not what we're invited to do. God is inviting you and I to be conformed by His Word not to conform his word and bites and phrases to what we think it should mean. We're to take the humble position, which is the peaceful position, and be molded by the word of God. So as Jesus draws near, it's important for us to understand and remember this, this truth that you can have inner peace and at the same time weep over your city or your community, your church or your school, your, your classmates, your students, your coworkers. You can have a deep and profound rest and rejoice in Christ and still be weeping over the sorrow for sin and suffering that you see all around you. Jesus does, after all. No one has been filled with more inner peace than God himself. Perfect shalom, in, in, in total harmony with himself, with his surroundings, with all that's taking place in the seen and the unseen world that he has created. It's also important for us to remember that compassion is a Christian virtue. It's an important virtue, even if it leads us to the point of tears. And that is not to say that all Christians who are crying are doing so wholly. certainly don't mean to be saying that. My family knows a thing or two about crying. We're kind of experts. And sometimes we're crying out of self-pity, or sometimes we're crying out of fear, or an anxiety that won't dissipate. But there are times where we, as I'm sure you have tasted, tears that come out of an abundance of joy and an abundance of compassion for the senseless and needless suffering that we do to one another, that we are so quick to, to shed blood. We're so quick to destroy and consume others for our own sake. We are, in many ways, a destructive people. And Jesus knows all too well the nature of our bloodthirst. He's come to redeem us from it, rescue us, deliver us from that amidst many other things. But compassion itself is a Christian virtue. In its truest form, in its purest form, it's a clear rebuke against apathy and indifference. How often are you or I apathetic? or indifferent to the suffering of others. I think for many of us, apathy or numbness perhaps is just a polite form of hard-heartedness. Compassion is a Christian virtue. And so I ask you, for whom do you weep? For whom do you lose sleep? For whom do your eyes fill with tears? This is a truly Christian 
virtue. It's also one in which Jesus knows not just what's coming this week or this hour. He knows not just the state and condition of the particular souls who inhabit the city in this particular moment, on this particular week as he's entering into the city. See, Jesus also has prophetic knowledge, absolute knowledge. Remember, he's God, full of all the omnis, including omniscience, which means all-knowing. Jesus knows all things, and he knows that as he enters into Jerusalem this week, it's the last time he will see Jerusalem as it has been. Because he will die, he will rise again, he will ascend to glory, and in a few decades, the city of Jerusalem will be surrounded and destroyed. So he goes on in verses 43 and 44 to explain this to us. Long before it ever happens, Jesus says this, For the days will come upon you, he's speaking of Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Okay, there's a couple of pieces of this we have to gather around. And the first is that history tells us that this is exactly what happens. In the A.D. year 70, under the Roman general Titus, Jerusalem is indeed surrounded and besieged, being reduced to rubble. The holy city of David, reduced to rubble. The temple of God in all its splendor, this second temple Judaism. Beautiful building, sparkling white marble encrusted and jeweled. This temple was destroyed completely. But so too were the families that lived in this city. War is so ugly. The blood of women and children flowing in the streets instead of the blood of animals which had for so many years been flowing in the temple. See, there was no more need for the blood of bulls or goats to be shed in the holy temple. The lamb had come and his blood had been shed for the forgiveness of sins. No one is cleansed without the shedding of blood. And yet the destruction that was coming is something that God in his justice poured out on Jerusalem. Rome and the armies of Rome under Titus were here a tool of God to bring judgment upon the city of God for their not knowing, for their not understanding, for their not being willing to receive their king on his terms. That's what we see in this final clause here. This will happen because you did not know the time of your visitation. See, God had come to them. This is what's so tragic. This is what's so overwhelming, that the city of God, that Jesus has known from his earliest days. Remember, Luke's gospel begins 
with the prophecy of John the Baptist given to his dad while he was serving where? In the temple. This gospel account is coming full circle. Jesus himself brought to the temple at eight days old. We know he's visited here before. He's a good Jew. His parents took him to the feasts and festivals. We see him as a 12-year-old preparing to take on the law with all its demands in a unique and powerful way in his bar mitzvah. And yet, he weeps for a city that he loves, that he's known from eternity past, that he'll always know for eternity future, but he will never quite be the same as when he is standing there, walking in her streets, listening to the buzz that's unique to her as a city, to the inhabitants that are there both now and will be when it's surrounded and sieged upon. This is what brings him to tears. They did not know the hour of their visitation. And honestly, friends, there is nothing sadder than those who have heard the gospel rejecting their God rejecting the true God of history, despite all the teaching, despite all the preaching, despite all the healings, despite all the miracles that had taken place, the driving out of demons, the resurrection from the dead, despite all the things that Jesus had spectacularly brought forth. Most of them were interested in a king like them instead of being made like their king. And so all of this unfolds exactly as Jesus prophesied, exactly as he had promised. See, God has come. He's come in the flesh, and they had rejected him. The judgment of Jerusalem is just. And there's no more need for the temple. Because all that the temple sacrifices had pointed to is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God slain for the sin of the people of God. Eternal payment that justifies their being brought near. There's one more thing before we close, and that's this. Please don't ever believe the lie that God is unmoved by human suffering. I know that there are many of us who are wrestling in this moment with God's goodness and God's power. In the time of this as in any other pandemic, as in any other global reality, any other suffering that comes and is visited upon any town, any judgment that is poured forth by the throne room of heaven and its decree, the people of God are tempted to pit God's goodness against his power or his power against his goodness. But let me remind you, that God is deeply moved and troubled in spirit by human suffering. God takes no pleasure in the death, even of the wicked, let alone his own people. Never believe the lie that God is unmoved by human suffering. He is so moved by our suffering, that he takes it upon himself, not only on the cross, but in the mediation of his covenant. See, we are blessed in our suffering because Jesus 
received suffering and made it holy. Holy worship uh, given unto his Father. So we have peace with God by the suffering of Christ. God takes upon himself that which we could not bear and still know his benevolence. This is critical for us to understand. His tears teach us to mourn for this world so full of sin and death. We should be filled with his holy compassion, welling up in tears when we see sorrow and suffering, when we see the plight of the poor or the widow or the orphan, we should be moved and troubled along with him. And we are. And we cry out just as the world around us sees suffering and calls it useless. Jesus sees it and says, I will even use that to sanctify and set apart my people, that they would know me and glorify me and that I would know them. The fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews goes so far as to say that he was perfected by the sufferings he experienced, being made ready to be our mediator. He is tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, that's the difference. But no suffering done in faith is in vain. God uses our suffering, overflowing in his compassion, to sanctify his people, just as he was once sanctified by it himself. God is desperately moved by our sorrow, moved to the point of taking on our sin through his suffering and death and rising victoriously over death, over sorrow, over suffering, conquering it for us that we will one day live in a place with him where there will be no more shedding of tears over human suffering because it will all be gone. Isn't that amazing? Oh, how we long for that day. Sing in the coming moments to the God who has accomplished all of this and more in the coming and redeeming of Christ in the redemption that he's brought forward for his people. Are you one of his people this morning? Receive Christ and live.